This show is a member of the Sorgatron Media Podcast Network. Find out more at sorgatronmedia.com. This show is brought to you by IndieWrestling.us. Check out IWC, RWA, and more. And listeners like you, support this show at Patreon.com slash Wrestling Mayhem Show. Hey guys, it's the Indie Mayhem Show. I'm Mike Sorg at Sorgatron on the Twitter here in the Sorgatron Media Studios in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. This is the show where we talk with people in and around independent professional wrestling and try to uh, you know, get to know them a little bit. And we'll do the same today. And of course, please go check out everything at WrestlingMayhemShow.com for more of this and many other pro wrestling related podcasts over there. And subscribe to the Indie Mayhem Show wherever you like to get your podcasts or see the video versions on the IndieWrestling.us Facebook or the Wrestling Mayhem Show uh, YouTube and I saying that out loud I realize how weird that is uh, but either way they get shared to either location uh, also check out indie wrestling.us uh, also for many of the indie wrestling I'm sorry indie mayhem show episodes and a lot of people we talk with on the shows are featured over there in the catalog uh, at indie wrestling.us and www.indie wrestling.network go check those out our guest today he's been on the list for a while but you know there was always you know that sometimes I'm just waiting for that moment, right, in their career. It's like, no, that's not it yet. That's not it yet. And then recently there was a pretty big shift for this gentleman today, and uh, he is here with us. Noctis is with us, or as Chachi and I like to refer to, Jeffrey. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> how you doing? How did that even come about? I can't remember. I don't know. We just determined when uh, you were still masked, and we were just like, you know what? I, you know, it's not this his last name. You know, we just kind of like, well, he needs a, he needs a first name. We're like, at one time you were I did, Brock Noctis. Uh, we, we had Brock we Rock Jeffrey. Rock this. Rock this because you teamed up with J Rock, <laughs> J-Rock one, one time. That one time. Yeah, one time with J Rock, and uh, which which really kind of drove home is like, oh, he definitely needs another name. Yeah. <laughs> I was really hoping the 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 Rock this thing would have would have picked up a little bit uh, I, I, I was hoping and then me and j-rock couldn't get our schedules together with rwa just never it just oh, fell through man that, that could be, that could have been the best thing since pb smooth and hornswoggle <laughs> <laughs> i don't know if anything's better than pb smooth the seven foot savage and dylan postal yes <laughs> like, in a team named twins uh <laughs> But uh, anyways, but no, uh, we like the little bit of icebreaker other than making fun of your name uh, here. <laughs> so what is your earliest memory of professional wrestling? So my earliest memories, there's two of them. And I don't I don't know if top of my head they're right around the same time. I mm-hmm. know they are generally, but... But they're the ones that, 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 that bring with you. Well, the first one, that I remember this one first, but I know it came later. Mm-hmm. It was the DX invasion of the Norfolk Arena when they were going head-to-head with uh, Monday Nitro, Mm -hmm. right? But the other one is when Kevin Nash long-darted Rey Mysterio into the truck, which I know came first, but my first memory is always DX invading. It was the stronger one. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, it was. I mean, seven-foot-tall Kevin Nash throwing five-foot-five Rey Mysterio is an impressive feat, Mm -hmm. but he's, at the time, 5'5 and 140 pounds, Mm -hmm. and Kevin Nash, to this day, who is almost 60, still benches like 350, so... It's incredible. But, yeah, the man is a genetic freak. He really Mm -hmm. is. If it wasn't for the knees, man. Uh, I mean, that's what what kills him. The knees and the hamstring. Being so big... Yeah, that's the problem. Because the thing is, like, we all have the same bone density, no Mm -hmm. matter how big you are. But when you're 7 feet tall and 300 pounds legitimately, it's just rough on the body. I've got bad knees, and I'm 6 foot 210. Mm -hmm. So it's like, what do you do when you're that big? And then once you tear a quad, it just never stops. No, no. You you, you kind of don't, uh, you're never 100% from something like that. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, I mean, Hall of Famer, one of the best careers he could have had. I mean, I I think he did what he set out to do. I mean, he always said he got in wrestling for the money. He made plenty of it. (laughs) Plenty of money. So uh, from there, you know, was it kind of always with wrestling uh, throughout uh, uh, growing up? From a about seven or eight until about 16 when sports started being real big for me because mm-hmm. I was a three-sport athlete. Track and field was my thing, and I never had time to be at home. From the time I was like 16 till my graduate high school, I had a steady girlfriend, so I was never home enough to watch it. Other concerns. Always. You know what? Th- things just came up. Mm-hmm. I got back into it when I was in the Army, and I never stopped watching since. I can remember back... 
the first WrestleMania I ever watched was the WrestleMania where John Cena and CM Punk had their match. Mm -hmm. I mean, tremendous match. And that's ever since then, I've been back in. I got into Japan a couple years ago, and it's that's really what I watch now. I watch all the I'll watch all the pay per views and everything from WWE just to one see guys that I know and I've met and I see making a name for themselves on a much bigger scale, but also just to see the difference in match quality and the way they put them together and just mm -hmm. study. I make myself a student, so. That's awesome. Uh, you mentioned because I noticed, you know, one of the, one of the things I noticed early on uh, when you're coming out to the ring is you do, you did have the dog tags. You're you're an army guy, yes. and everything. So uh, tell me a little bit about that, that experience. So well, I the army kind of happened by accident. I, hmm. I was in um I was in sixth grade when nine eleven happened. So yeah. I always kind of wanted and had that drive. But when I went to college the first time, I got into a little bit of trouble in school because it turns out when you're an athlete in college, you have to go to class. Oh. I didn't know that. Oh, so what did you play? I, I was a high jumper at Cal U. Okay. So um, turns out when you go and you don't go to class, well, now you can't participate in track. So when all I went to college for was to be an athlete and now mm -hmm. I can't be an athlete, kind of sends you down a rabbit hole of getting – Politely asked to come back when you're more mature. Okay. Okay. So, so, so some some life disagreements with your uh, your your establishment of education. Yes. Got so it. I went to the military, mm -hmm. and I think it was the best decision of my life. It mm -hmm. put me into a much better situation, uh, maturity wise, as well as the, I've always had respect for other people, but the way I present myself towards them was much um, in a much better light after that. Good, and I think that's always interesting because I, I I wonder. People that come through something disciplined like the army, and then go into something disciplined like wrestling training like that. Do you think it's something that kind of helped you as you as you got into the training? Absolutely. Just because of the fact that I understood where the line was of what I couldn't do and what I shouldn't do, and with the way the way I was trained and who trained me, if I would have stepped out of line or had an ego still like I did mm -hmm. when I was 19, 20 years old. I'd have got the tar kicked out of me, and he wouldn't have taken <laughs> any crap from me. I mean, he still didn't, but I would have been in a much worse situation. And I just believe that because of that, I was able to become a, a professional wrestling student as opposed to just a trainee. Mm -hmm. Like I, I've, I've managed to incorporate a lot of different styles into what I do, a lot of different match structures, because I'm willing to watch and learn before I go out there and say, oh, I can do this. I know I can do it, but mm. now I want to learn why I'm doing it. And that's always been the biggest thing. Psychology in, in this business is bigger than any of the moves you can do. Because even people that go out there and they have some of the most athletic repertoires of techniques still have psychology of what they're doing. It's just not the ABCs of what everyone else is doing and if you don't have some idea behind your structure it's not gonna no one's gonna care in the end so, so tell me a little bit about getting into training you uh you're a graduate of the uh, iron city wrestling academy i am i know you you came out at a uh, proving grounds uh, uh how many years ago three -ish? it was february 27th i think or 22nd, whatever that weekend was of 2016. 2016. Yes. So just a couple of years in so the business. This, this February will be three years since my debut. So four years officially being in, involved in the business from training all the way through. Mm -hmm. um, but so that, how that happened was I actually started off by going to an independent show in West Newton, PA for RWA. And the only reason I went there, I had no idea what the Indies were until this day. It was Matt Hardy advertised to be wrestling against ryan mitchell oh that one that was a really <laughs> good match i went and i saw the match and i went for about the next six months to shows uh what now my best memory from that time was the anniversary show they did that following january where g raver won what seemed to be every award possible for being an inspirational babyface as he does uh so i talked to dr phil bad that night it was it was january of 2015 I talked to him and said, hey, what do I have to do to get involved in the business? He, and he sent me to IWC. Mm -hmm. He said, go talk to these guys. They have a great school, great reputation, and that's where you got to go. Mm -hmm. I emailed the, the website. I emailed the Facebook. I called. I texted. I did everything I could, and I just waited. And then I finally <laughs> got a call about it, and I showed up to the first tryout. And then I went, and I got accepted. And for the next month and a half, I went to the classes for the 
class about to have their proving ground, which was the Balk Nasty and Britt Baker class. Mm -hmm. So that was a really cool experience to see people get ready to debut before I went ahead and started the basics. So it, it was it was a nice experience to be there. And again, they had this they were trained the same way I was. Mm -hmm. So it's a really good experience to people who I consider to be good acquaintances and good business associates. So uh, wh who did you train under? Who was a uh, uh, honor at that point? My trainers were Super Hentai mm -hmm. and Joe Rosa. And then a little bit of Marshall Gambino sprinkled yeah. in there when he showed up. So uh, I feel that fundamentally and the working the stronger style that I work, I couldn't have got three better trainers. No. Because the way that Marshall and Hentai wrestle are very similar. And Joe is much more character based but he's like an 80s macho man so mm -hmm. it's very similar still but it's about being more over the top than anything which joe is traditionally a heel everywhere he goes and seeing that over the top heel when you see that a lot more in the baby face community mm -hmm. like seeing that was a it's a really good eye-opening experience for me it's just to see that because outside of seeing hulk hogan with nwo when he was hollywood hogan i didn't really see that all the over the top colorful characters are always the the good guys in the in the situation and so seeing joe do it to help me understand that you can still do that and still entertain while at the same time being a convincing bad guy um uh, joe rosa vip joe rosa i think we have an interview with him on indie mayhem show from around that era uh talk about what he was doing then it was it was a really interesting time with that with that and a lot of fun yeah so. I, that because that was right at the tail end of the founding fathers uh faces of change feud mm -hmm. so that was that was a fun one to be around for that uh, that war games match so i was sitting ringside for that work and security for uh, for iwc for that one nice um from there of course you debut as noctis you had the mask and everything where did. did the idea for the mask kind of come about so that came from I, I was still trying to separate my personal life from my private life right and just have that separation family you know, past and whatever and so I, I wore the mask but at the same time i also wanted to have that that darker undertone because like the word noctis I took from the Latin word noctum for darkness and night. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of, I have always had that as a character, that more aggressive, darker undertone. But it, as I transitioned out of wearing the masks to what I do today, it made a lot more sense with the way I present myself to the audience and to new promoters, new matches, whatever it may be. Sometimes it gets a little confusing. Uh, I, I do remember I was wrestling a match. It was a tag match, and it was me and Big Lenny versus, I think it was Stan Styles and Casey Reeves. Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting there, and Lenny asked, so what, what, what's your style? I was like, that's more of a Japanese style. He goes, well, you don't look Japanese. <laughs> and then I put the mask, and he goes, oh, I get it. <laughs> oh. Uh, I was like, Lenny, we've been wrestling in the same company together for like six or seven months. You know me. You, you, you know my first name. Yeah. Like. Yes, Jeffrey. No, <laughs> like you, you know Jeffrey. You know me. Like, come on. No, and this is about the time where I think like, we were joking before about Chachi and I kind of wanted to give you uh, a first name and everything too. Um, so because it was it was always like like there's something missing from this, right? Because <laughs> everybody we were just talking about like that Magnum CK moment, right? <laughs> where like you, like everything kind of turns around and clicks into a new character mm -hmm. that works, and and it seemed like that was happening. You had a. Uh, 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 was it Mask versus Title match? I believe a little bit yes. ago. Yes, it was Mask versus Title with Justin Idol, who mm -hmm. um, I have tremendous respect for in the business. He, I, he was involved in, like I said, that face of change, founding fathers feud. I looked to him for inspiration early in my career, and then uh, opportunity came up to wrestle against him, mm -hmm. and I went. I, I made the most of it. I we had five or six matches in the course of a year and I think that we had a lot of really good matches and I think that that mask versus title match was one of my better ones there was there was a critic who didn't like the match as much I could really care less <laughs> what he thought uh, because I only take so much value from everyone like you learn from whatever is told to you whether yeah. it's good or bad uh, his biggest critique was that um, I shouldn't wear trunks because I've we got a little bit too much fluff in the middle and my response to that should have been really really that, that affected the match it's good work though yeah <laughs> whatever i mean he he i i he's a good guy uh, yeah. i just that was one he put he actually wrote that in his review which mm -hmm. i don't think that had anything to do with reviewing the match mm -hmm. but that's just me what do i know i'm just just a dude right just a dude 
just the dude. Um, so, so were you were you concerned about like losing the mask? Because I mean, you know, first thing when you're wearing a mask, like you know, um, the emoting and, and and everything during a match is something different. Mm-hmm. And were you worried about like your look and presentation at that point? Well, when I someone asked me this actually that night, Hentai asked me because he was on the same show. He asked me, "Why are you doing this?" And yeah. it felt like the right time to do it mm-hmm. and at the same time i've also been getting grief from a couple of the boys about why do i wear a mask because i got a pretty face which very true i'm awfully pretty <laughs> like it <laughs> women love me and husbands typically don't like me too much because i'm very friendly with their wives but it's, it's not my fault i can't help that i can't help that i'm a nice person kind of a little bit ish ish i uh, I'm never mean to you. No, 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 not typically. No, but no, I, I just, I knew taking the mask off was the right thing to do. Mm-hmm. But at the same time that I wasn't too concerned about I, the way I would have to sell in the ring. Cause I've all, I always did under the mask. That's something I was always taught to always sell with your face, no matter what, uh, that I got from theater because mm-hmm. when you wear a mask in performance, you still have to use your face because if what you're doing here is going to be the same thing you're presenting with your body. So if I'm sad, whether I'm wearing a mask or not, if you can see my face and I'm presenting sad with my body, it's going to be more convincing if I believe that I'm sad. So when I took the mask off, it still worked out that I wouldn't have to change too much. It was more just going to be the way I went about conducting my matches because that was right around the time that I transitioned out of being a baby face and decided I was tired of being nice to fans because I don't like people mm-hmm. so it it's really easy when you just turn up the the arrogance a little bit and instead of being mean to just the promoter you're now mean to the fans too and no one can yell at you for that mm-hmm. so um speaking of we talked a lot about RWA uh yeah. here and definitely they have the most more interesting fan base i think locally um vocal reactive just it seems everything down there i I look at it this way and i give the same definition description every time i talk about the rwa it's an 80s crowd Mm -hmm. they may like you yeah they they may like you like there are fans that really like me as a wrestler as a person yeah but they will boo the hell out of me Mm -hmm. because they know they're supposed to Right. And I, I don't give them too much to like me in the ring. Yeah. Yeah, some of the stuff I do is cool and it looks good, but they know that what I'm doing is being an underhanded, shady person. And they're going to boo me. And they're going to love the baby faces, but they give everyone an opportunity there. When I first debuted, they were behind me right away. I was working to get, my debut match there was against C.A. Elliott in May of 17, right? And right away, they were behind me. They got into it and they enjoyed the match. And they were welcoming right away. Mm. So, but exactly. That's an 80s crowd, which can get a little out of hand because mm-hmm. Marshall did cause a real life riot yep. that very night. <laughs> like my first night there, there's a riot. And I said to another friend of mine, who's a good friend of Marshall's, maybe I got to be healed tonight. Cause I think someone's going to try to kill Marshall. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I got, I got to protect my boy. Uh, but it's so great because he came back around and it was kind of doing his retirement uh, uh, way out, and everybody just was loving him. It, they, they, they roll right with it. When you look at Marshall, you, you see what he does, and you know, you know the type of person he is in the ring. Mm-hmm. You know how he is. He doesn't present himself as being a pleasant human being, Mm-mm. but he's so good at what he does that you can't. You may hate him, but you can't dislike him as a performer. Yeah. And it was really easy for them to get around to because they saw that transition. They saw how much passion he put into what he was doing for them. And fans love that. So. Absolutely. Uh, tell me, of course, you started at IWC. I uh, had a few matches there for a bit. Seemed to transition to RWA for mm-hmm. a bit. Um, was it just like a kind of a, a, a an opportunity thing that, that kind of uh, rolled from one to the other here locally? Well, I'd always wanted to get in with RW. It's where I got. It's where I that's, got the opportunity. But that's right. Derek, Derek pushed and, me and that I think Lola, Lola was saying she was at like the same shows you were. So yeah, yeah. Like, I was at a lot of those shows early on. Um, my, I would take my daughter there. My best friends were there with me. But mm-hmm. that opportunity w- finally came up, and it just so happened that I wasn't really doing much for IWC. Yeah, they didn't have a lot for me. I was working a lot of pre-show matches with the younger kids, and that's fine. I've got no problem with that. But I was putting a lot of work in for them with not a lot of return on it. Mm-hmm. So when the opportunity came up, I talked to Justin Plummer, the owner. I said, hey, I have this opportunity. Um, 
can I go? Are you okay with this? Because I didn't want bad terms. Yeah. He gave me my break. He gave me my opportunity to train, and we have a great relationship. Yeah. Uh, he told me, go ahead, make a name for myself. He, and he told me, if, when you want to come back, you let me know, and I'll bring you back in. Mm-hmm. He's had me back for a few things. Battle Royal is here and there. Yeah. Just sometimes yeah. when he needs me. He knows if he, he's got to show up in Royal Valley, wherever, I'm there. But the competition is just so so strong between Fight Society, Rise, mm-hmm. RWA, RWA. Mm-hmm. IWC that if you oversaturate yourself too much that and, and that's a company that that brings in a lot of outside talent yeah. and generates really good internal talent as you see from I yeah. mean, we're just how, what names that we mentioned Britt Baker you know Britt Baker like that. Bald yeah. Nasty yeah uh, Logan Shirley who I mean well, El- Elias uh, yeah where's <laughs> he I mean uh she it's DJ Z DJ Z yeah, is like can... a lot of, I mean the facade mm-hmm. so it's uh, guys that come from here that like Go- again, Gory, mm-hmm. so who is one of the most popular baby faces in this area, maybe ever. Could be, yeah. So Except like, for, I don't know. Sly- Elias did just make his face turn, so yeah. Yeah. So I mean, <laughs> but it's it's such a good place for opportunity, mm-hmm. and I got to meet a lot of great people. I've met a lot of people who are their impact now. People who are in Japan. People who are out in L.A. making big splashes and a lot of that's because I trained with IWC and I got the opportunity to network. Mm. I've got opportunity to meet some names, train under them and things that I wouldn't have gotten a lot of other places. And it gave it gave me a sense of determination and drive that I don't know I would have had in the business because I was a little skeptical when I got in because I got in a little bit older in life. I'm mm-hmm. not I'm not I'm almost 30 now, so I'm not too old, but when I was breaking in everyone was 18, 19, 20 years old, so I'm five, six years older than them, worried that I'm I'm too old. And I just happen to have been pushed in the right direction by the right people. So uh, I'm very thankful for the opportunities I had with IWC, but when I got the chance to go to RWA, knowing I was going to get the opportunities there. When when I first got there, I had my first match, Dr. Phil Bed said, I can't promise this is an every month thing. Mm-hmm. But I knew, and I say it all the time, if I get one opportunity – you're bringing me back. I'm I'm good enough in the ring, and I'm pleasant enough of a person business-wise that you don't have a hard time working with me. Like, I'm about to go to Canada at the end of this month, and I asked for a number, and they said, yeah, no problem, because of the way we went about conducting business. And it was all over social media. So I'm about to go internationally. I'm getting the number I want to go there, and I'm getting some wrestling the market I've never been in, and it's hopefully going to be a jumping point for me in the, in the north region, the northeast. Maybe try to get out western Canada one day. Maybe go make a visit out the Lance Storm. Say hi. He, he ha- Join Team Storm. I, I don't know about all that. I, I don't know about all I that. Mean, because you really want to hang out with Jackson and Jack and RC. RC, I mean. yes. I like RC a lot. Jackson's okay. a little much to deal with. All right. All ja- right. Jack's. Jack's Jack. Yeah. No. There's nothing wrong with Jack. I like Jack you a lot. You gotta respect the Jack. Uh, I, yeah. I respect the if Jack. No, if you're unsure about the other two, you gotta respect Jack. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. The, there's not, There's no <laughs> less respect for any person on this planet than you can have for for Jack Snargos. But Jack Pollock, you know, he is the next trending topic. I mean, yes, exactly. I mean, you, you, got, you gotta like that, man. I remember I first seeing him in RWA, uh, like, under that moniker, and I'm just like... So he's a Facebook guy, and it's it's really come around, and, it, and it, it makes sense now. It's it is really funny how it all works out, and just getting to see where he's at right now, where all three of those guys are at right now. Yeah, compared to me, me and Jackson started around the same time in yeah, uh, yeah. IWC. RC RC's first match with IWC was in a cluster match, uh, <laughs> and it was a ten man tag match. Before Super Indy. Oh, God. Oh, it was... It was, it was a bad match. <laughs> that match sucked. Like, I, I've had... I say all the time, like, I've had my worst matches already in my career, and they were both that same Is year. Is it one of those I filmed and just kind of forgot about for reasons? <laughs> oh, so... <laughs> the worst match I'll ever have. At no fault of the person I'm in the match with. It was me and Dan Hooven at High Stakes 1. Oh, we did not include that on the DVD. Yeah, like <laughs> we when, were, we were asked. I, Hooven asked me oh, not to put it on the DVD. When, when we 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 got the word last minute, we had to do it. 
And you were you were killing time for we were killing somebody time that was the uh, steamboat was the coming. Steamboat in. was coming yeah. in. His he had a late flight, so we had to kill time. Mm-hmm. And originally, we were told we we're going to go on a certain time. We're like, hey, cool, no problem. We can handle that. It's easy. Then we found out last minute we we're going to go on right after intermission, mm-hmm. which is a terrible spot to be in. Yeah. Like, originally, that match was supposed to be Britt and Katie Arquette. I believe was what the match was. It was Britt and Katie that that night, which they had a really good match. But to go in and have me and Hooven have that match to get the crowd back into it, you have to have a certain amount of, you know, a certain amount of stuff in that match to get them into it. And we didn't have time to put anything together, so we went in there, and that was like his fifth match, and I was like a little over a year in the business and not ready to. You, you were you <laughs> wasn't ready to put that match on right. Nobody, like, nobody was the vet to put the match together. Basically, yeah. yeah. Like, now I've now my second match ever. I was I put the match together, but that was with my training partner yeah. Shane. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah, me yeah. and Shane like were you knew and had a vibe with. So, but oh, uh, it was and the worst part was me and Dan had had tremendous practice matches. Mm-hmm. We went ahead and just. Killed it when he was training. We might but have that. We might have to throw that match out there and with this interview. That uh, maybe that'll was, be for you guys on gold. That match was atrocious. <laughs> there are people that say you, you always remember your worst match, mm-hmm. and I've been lucky enough that my worst match was a year into the business, mm-hmm. and I have. It has been scrubbed from the record. <laughs> yes, great people on my side, and thank God. Like what I. I can remember I rolled out of the ring after the pinfall. And again, at the time, I'm working as a baby in IWC. And and Plumber goes, you're the hero. And I went, all right, cool. Here we go. And then I rolled out of the ring. I shook my head and walked away from the ring. I was just like, I'm, I'm done. Going to I, the think, I think it's one of those. I'm wearing side film on this thing. And I think I might have resp- responded, what the fuck was that? Oh, my God. <laughs> it was so bad. Oh, boy. Oh, it was and in a casino. Oh, yeah. So, hey, you know what? We did really bad in front of a sold-out crowd. <laughs> <laughs> it was awesome. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, Jeez. At least it wasn't a dark match on WWE. Oh, uh, yeah. I'd never get called back. No, 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 no. So uh, so what are you watching these days? What um, You mentioned a little bit about like watching the, the main stuff to kind of like, like you know, see what's going on there and in, in styles and everything. Like, what what is... um. Either individuals or promotions that uh, you're maybe watching that that have caught your eye. Most of what I see in Japan really just catches me, mm-hmm. just because of the way it's transitioned out of just the hard hitting strong style to having more of that showmanship in the past few years because of the gaijin wrestlers that are that are over there, and seeing that transition, it's really caught my attention for how I produce myself in the ring because again i was i was trained by super hentai who's very japanese oriented the way he trains the way he competes well, uh, trained and that's that's no lie trained in hayabusa japan yeah and so whenever i got a chance to finally dive into new japan i spent the next 16 months watching every major event they had every sub event they had i never missed one until i got so busy with what I'm doing with the rest of my life, I now go back and watch it later. But I, that's that's what I dive into. Now, I'm able to see that transition back into WWE and to Impact because you see a lot of those guys that got to start in Japan, they're doing more over here. Mm-hmm. They're being brought in. You have Shinsuke Nakamura. You have guys who went over there and became well-respected wrestlers like AJ Styles, Machine Gun Anderson, Luke Gallows. Like They're all now in WWE and you see that difference, you see that transition, and you see a lot of the other guys who were basically brought up in the WWE system transitioning because now they're competing with those other guys. So seeing that the arguably the two biggest companies in the world have very similar styles and the way they put on their shows, it's just now how is it how's it go about you. You watch a Japan show and you don't really see anything that you say, you know what? I could have went to the bathroom during that match and not missed it. <laughs> but if you watch WWE, it's unfortunate to say that there's still some matches where if you miss it, you don't care. And it's I watched Wrestle Kingdom last year and we people complain about WWE's WrestleMania last year being like seven hours. Wrestle Kingdom was six hours. And it doesn't feel like it. That's how you feel it, right? Like, exactly. Like and you see the audience even there during the early matches. During the pre-show for Wrestle Kingdom, it's a big battle royal, right? Just like the Royal Rumble's done. But people were into it. 
right away. And they were there into it from start to end for six hours. No one seemed to be tired of the show. I would say, I, I would say though, you don't get to see the crown in the same way. So yeah. I wonder a little bit, right? They're not lit in the same way. They're kind of further away from the ring. Mm-hmm. So you don't see any yawns or anything. You just see, you know, the announcers and space. Yeah. So, but still, there is definitely energy throughout the night. They don't get bored. And and it's really funny because a lot of a lot of wrestlers from America and Europe that go to Japan have a hard time adjusting at first because the Japanese crowd is traditionally a quieter, calmer crowd. But they're starting to really pick up. And Wrestle Kingdom last year, there were there were chants so loud that it was deafening. Whenever Minoru Suzuki came out for his entrance. They had 43,000 in the audience there. During a part of his entrance song, there's a lyric, Katsa Ninare, it means become the wind. And it was so loud. When people ask me what's over, I show them that clip. And people that aren't wrestling fans hear that and they go crazy. Mm-hmm. And like when I heard that at Russell King, I actually got goosebumps. I'm getting them now talking about it. Talking about an entrance for a guy who's been wrestling for 30 years in Japan. Like... It's I love that culture and to be able to watch it evolve and to become a mega power in wrestling again because there was a, a long period where New Japan, despite being one of the bigger companies in the world, they weren't doing anything. Guys like Minoru Suzuki and uh, Hiroshi Tanahashi stuck around there and made it a big powerhouse again. And then you had the Finn Balors and the AJ Styles and those those guys really help elevate them by adding a different character and a different attitude in there with the the western style of heels because you finally had people coming in and interfering in matches and having that other side that you didn't see in japan that really stepped their their market up and now they're arguably bigger than wwe in certain parts of the world absolutely let's let's be honest ring of honor new japan sold out the garden going head to head with nxt on wrestlemania weekend Jesus. Sold out the garden. Incredible. I like, and it happened in like a day and a half. It, it can't tell me worldwide wrestling isn't hot again. Like you know, it's not. It's not Monday Night War, but this is something different on a bigger it, level. It really is. And yeah. Someone asked me the other day if I think that wrestling's as popular as it was back then. I argue that it's more popular mm-hmm. because it's more mainstream now. Mm-hmm. Because and the reason why wrestling fans are like, oh, wrestling sucks these days. It's because it went from being like this indie cult to being a mainstream thing and no one ever likes when they're when they're their indie darlings go mainstream like we can use the music (laughs) music artists like the band afi they were around forever deep cuts right and then when they finally went mainstream with the album sing the sorrow they were on mtv they had a softer sound and fans hated it but now we look back that was 15 years ago i was in middle school when that happened and they're still around touring today. So did they really, did they suck? They're still making a lot of money mm-hmm. touring the world and people still love them. And that's the same thing with wrestling. Wrestling is the same thing as the music industry. WWE is touring and, and playing the hits. Yeah. yeah. And But now we're starting to see the new songs, the new new styles, and it's, it's getting big. You got a little bit of a chat room pop for the AFI mentions, by the way. Boom. That's awesome. Uh, wait, so you've been at it for a while. RWA, you've been around a bit. Uh, to different promotions. Uh, I think we were talking about Black Diamond. You've yep. been up down there for that, too. Were you in the Battle Royal? I was not. I was actually booked in Ohio uh, that night at QCW. See, I literally have to ask everybody because I was there, and <laughs> yeah. I filmed it, <laughs> and I still don't know. If, I'm still like, wait, were you there? I actually have yeah. no idea because, I mean, when there's 109 people yeah. in across three rings, like I saw people come in and never saw them leave. Yeah, originally I was supposed to be there because it was originally supposed to be on September 1st. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. But then they changed to the second. I was already booked at QCW. Yeah. And now QCW is relatively new, but I'm a mainstay on their roster and they've given me a lot of opportunity. And I told them, if you have a date and I'm not working RWA that night, mm-hmm. I'll be there for you. It's like RWA is my home promotion right now and QCW is my second. So it's like how Marshall was IWC, RWA. I'm RWA, QCW. So if like, one of those companies have a show i'm nowhere else yeah i've passed up on opportunities to be with my daughter for wrestling shows at rwa and qcw i've passed up on bachelorette party or bachelor parties rather well i actually did miss a bachelorette party because i was the only guy invited to my high school best friend's party and i was like well thank you i don't really want to see a male stripper but i appreciate the opportunity to come to your bachelorette party 
at one point in time, one of my friends asked me if I would be the stripper for it. And I went, no, I don't do that <laughs> because I don't exploit my body for nothing. But I will exploit my body for wrestling and beat myself up and, you know, walk around in underwear for fans to, you know, it's, boo it's, me. You know, Duke Davis said that, 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 that stripping and, uh, and pro wrestling is actually kind of the same job. It, you got to think about your entrance music and everything. I made that comparison at the first Stan Style show. <laughs> the intergender bonanza? Yes. And I think her name is... I don't know what the woman's name is. I can't remember. I don't want to put her on blast. But I made the comparison. She, like, tried to rip me apart. I went, think about this. Men and women come out here wearing basically nothing. And we're paid to entertain an audience who doesn't know our real names. They know a <laughs> stage name. And let me be honest, you're wearing glitter tonight. You're on an elevated stage with everybody surrounding you. And we come out and we... You're wearing glitter. You're So, like, don't... Some of us are wearing makeup. <laughs> yeah, some of us are wearing... Troy Lords wears makeup and glitter. So, how can you tell me and yell at me and chastise me for saying that wrestling is stripping? There's a parallel there. But guess what? There are strippers making more money than some of the ma major guys in the wrestling business right this now. This is true, too. This so is true, too. who's doing worse? I think we need to look at both the business models and see what works. <laughs> oh, Noctis, did I get both the good and the bad? I can't remember right now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it, hasn't been, it hasn't been too bad. I mean, okay. th there's, there's plenty of time left down the road to do this again i mean it only took me two and a half years to do the first one that's right that's right we'll yeah. check it in another two and a half years <laughs> yeah. and see where you're at right around year five we'll see we'll see if i've uh done, if i've won any more titles or put the mask on by then yeah put the mask on. on maybe maybe i'll find a way to double stomp john roden in the testicles again <laughs> <laughs> uh shout outs of course the chat room uh some great reactions out there uh zeke mercer is saying what's up and What's a little, little little thing there. Uh, of course, Lola's <laughs> hanging out in the chat room, uh, and I'm seeing a few other wheels is hanging out as well of course throughout he the is. night. Uh, thank you, Noctis. Where can people find you online? Well, Instagram and Twitter, real underscore Noctis. Facebook, real Noctis. Uh, it's everywhere. You can also see my new sidekick, Puptis, on there. She's an adorable little pit bull. Somebody was mentioning something about the, your dog too. You know, yeah. Puptis is a champ. She's uh, a vicious little pit bull who pup. is super loving and really likes people. So I can't take her to the ring because she's not a heel. So mm, when pup. she starts biting kids, take her to the ring. Pup, this is adorable. Pup, this is adorable. <laughs> Says so. the chat. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. And of course, uh, you have a show. You'll be at the next RWA, I believe. I will not be. You'll I will not be, not be on RWA it. until January. <gasps> Yeah. In the meantime, in the meantime, um, you can check out uh, Noctis. Uh, just until recently, tag team champion over there. We didn't even talk about your tag team. That's okay. We'll get there. We'll, <laughs> we'll, get we'll there. have. We have to. I'm just gonna show up next time you do a podcast. That is true. Let's <laughs> start showing up. If, if, yeah, he's in, he's in the loop. This is where I usually get. Hey, can I come back? Hey, can I come back? I'm yeah. just gonna start doing run-ins. <laughs> like I know, I know where we're at. I'm just gonna like I'm down here all the time. I'm just gonna do a run-in. Come on in. Push whoever's out of the way. And then go get a taco. Across. And then go get a taco. There you go. Go check them out. Look up Noctis and Royal Greatness on IndieWrestling.us and on our VOD collection, especially for the later matches. Um, and uh, check out all that, IndieWrestling.us. And uh, I'm trying to think of anything else I need to plug that you're a part of there. Also, please check out the Indie Wrestling Network. A lot of great content going on over there. You can get a free trial at www.indywrestling.network. And, uh, and, of course, uh, follow the Renegade Wrestling Alliance and follow Noctis to find out where he's going to be showing up next. And if you have a promotion in your area that you want Noctis to show up to, go connect with that promoter. Go tell him, hey, check out this Noctis guy. He's swell. Eh, and, swell. He and he has a adorable dog. <laughs> Yeah, that'll get you booked. We'll get it. We got it. We're we're working on it. All right. Uh, so until next time, please support indie wrestling. This show is a member of the Sorgatron Media Podcast Network. Find out more at sorgatronmedia.com.